Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Greg Wiseman, 0, 0, 1. Recognized, Brandon Vietti, 0, 0, 2. Recognized, Phil Brassa, 0, 0, 3. Initiate part one. Hello team. Today we are out of the Watchtower and have zated to Burbank, California to sit down with Phil Barassa, art director for Young Justice as well as animated movies like Planet Hulk and Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Brandon Vietti, Young Justice producer and showrunner as well as director of animated movies and series like Under the Red Hood, Batman, The Brave and the Bold, and The Legion of Superheroes, and Greg Weissman, producer and co-creator of Spectacular Spider-Man, Gargoyles, and of course, Young Justice. Greg, Brandon, and Phil. Welcome to Whelmed. Thank Hello. you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Before we begin, as always, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. We will only be discussing Young Justice Season 3 in the context of what's been released so far, so the standard Weissman Vietti hashtag no spoilers protocol is in effect. Uh, and with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, one of the first things I ask most of my guests is, when did you first see Young Justice? So, we're going to get to that in a few minutes. It's yeah. <laughs> um, a funny one. But what I do want to talk about a little bit, uh, which Brandon, you uh, actually talked about a little bit on the live DC Universe with Kevin Smith, was your guys' history with DC Comics before you even got into doing animation. But I want to start with Phil, because I, I know a little bit more about them, but not as much about you. So. Mm. What what was your history with not just DC Comics, but comics in general? Like, what got you into this? I was a huge Marvel Comics fan. Nice. <laughs> nice. You're out. For laying uh, it no, all on the table. Uh, no, do it. <laughs> no, I mean, for me, you know, I think I have early memories of, like, some Marvel characters on trading cards or something like that mm -hmm. in the early 80s. Uh, like, how, long, how young were you? Uh, I was probably, like four or five when okay. you can remember something. Right, it's kind of a, yeah. a, as much emotional memory as actual yeah, and, memory. And I have an older brother, he's 21 months older, so we're really close, and he was better than me at everything, including drawing. And uh, so I, he would always draw like Spider-Man and like, you know, some Star Wars characters and stuff for me. Do you mock him now? No, oh, he was, okay. yeah, he was, yeah, he's he's got his own thing. <laughs> he's a good dude. But yeah, there's always going to be a little sibling rivalry. We won't delve into that. <laughs> um, no, but I, uh, in the mid 80s, Marvel released the uh, official handbook of the Marvel Universe. Oh, yeah. And that was a huge yeah. sort of, that was like, you know, the codex for what would end up being, you know, interestingly enough, my career ended up sort of, mirroring that fascination with those sort of biography style like art books you know right, what i mean right. Right. there was a kid on my street i had never been to a comic shop but one of uh my good friends that i grew up with that was my next door neighbor he had one of the handbooks and he was like already a young hustler and he would like cut out entries and sell them for a dime so he'd make like you know i don't know what it was but they were like a dollar and dude would end up making like five dollars on them yeah the 80s were great uh <laughs> But yeah, no, that was that was my sort of uh, intro to comic book characters. Did you have a straight through line to doing kind of what you do now, or did you find yourself kind of heading in this direction? Like, do you? Yeah, I do you mean, know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I I always so you know we didn't we didn't have like money to get lots of comics, but the we did have some that we traded between right. friends, and so my brother and I and a couple of the friends we grew up with would draw our own. Oh, comic books. That's the way to get around it. Yeah, so we made, but we basically just did knockoffs of the Marvel characters and created our own universe. And then, you know, I could always draw as a kid. So then, you know, I was the kid that could draw in school or whatever. So, you know, we didn't have like specific art curriculum, but I did take an art class in school and, you know, teachers recognized my ability and stuff. So I was kind of encouraged to pursue that direction. Yeah, graduated high school, got accepted into Art Center, but even back then it was too expensive. Oh, yeah. So I didn't go, and I uh, just started working on my own personal stuff, developing my own ideas with, like, sort of a vague notion of breaking into comics at some point. Yeah. Yeah, and did uh, actually started in my late teens, started working on um, 
like an independent comic book. I was trying to break into the mainstream, but I was going about it kind of, you know, in a, in a very sort of circuitous way. Cause like typically you're encouraged to like do sample pages. Uh, if you're trying to get a job at Marvel, they want to see sample pages of right. Spider-Man or Wolverine or whatever. If you're trying to get a job at DC, it's their marquee characters, Batman, whoever. But I would go to these conventions and this is like in the mid to late nineties with like a portfolio full of my own characters and my own comic book pages from my own like universe, which is like kind of sci-fi fantasy stuff like that. I got some good feedback, but the comic book industry was kind of in a slump at the point where I was kind of ready. Yeah. I was going to say that probably was not a great time. It was time. a bad time. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't good. Yeah. So that was, and, but every year and it would be San Diego comic con. Cause I, I originally I'm from LA. So it was just hopped down to San Diego. Totally. You know, and so it would be, you know, every year going back, getting good feedback, but no real leads till finally I had created this whole narrative in this entire comic book. And a buddy of mine showed me some newspaper article about the uh, Zarek Foundation, which was oh, yes. Peter Laird, <laughs> co-creator of Ninja Turtles. Uh -huh. He set up a foundation for independent comic book artists and self-publishers because that's how he and Eastman got their start. Yep. So this is like 99 or something like that or 2000. And he was like, yo, like, why don't you just make your own book? And so I was like, cool. I had this whole book already drawn and inked and written and everything. I applied for the grant, got the full amount, which was, I think, $5,000, which covered my printing costs for two issues. First one was in color. Back down to San Diego to a crowd of about 100,000 people, I sold maybe 50 copies, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, I was right. Like, I didn't look it's at all it relative, like, wow, man. I barely scratched it, you know, made it. The people that bought the comic book, though, it turned out were almost all industry professionals because they were curious and they saw something that they, you know, had potential or whatever. And one of those people happened to be an executive producer, an executive at uh, Warner Brothers Animation named Marge Dean. So wow. she gave my comic book to Dennis Cowan, who hired me to do character design on the third season of Static Shock oh, and nice. uh, help him sort of reinvent the look of it. They figured out pretty quickly how inexperienced I was, but, you know, they were willing to take a chance. And well, there's a difference between there's a difference between like inexperienced and and not talented or two different sure. things. Yeah, like yeah, when you look at someone and you think this is for any job, yeah. right? So, or whatever you're doing, you can look at someone and say like, we want to work with this person. We see something there and this person can be taught or sure. we can, we can help them get to where we want them to be. Right. That's the latter is the harder part when yeah. you're hiring someone oh, for a absolutely. position. Right. Yeah. So yeah. clearly they saw something in you clearly because sure. you're still here Yeah. and we're having this well, conversation. I've, I've bounced around a bit, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I always say you, you go like the day, the day you transition from amateur to professional, you go. Typically, you go from being like the best amateur to the worst right, professional. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yes, so, absolutely. And not in, maybe not in terms of your ethic or your or your you know determination or discipline even, but in terms of your understanding and your right. technique and your you know all that stuff. So right. Um, but yeah, started on Static, worked at Warner's for a few years, bounced around the industry, came back here in 2008 to do to design a movie for Bruce Tim, which was like you know. I, I was like, are you sure you guys have the right number? <laughs> um, because when I was, when I broke into Warner Brothers, if you didn't draw like Bruce, right. you weren't really doing superheroes. I mean, even, you know, the Teen Titans stuff, which was Murakami's offshoot, that still comes from that same gene pool. Jeff Mitsuda came in with The Batman, which was like a, 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 a different approach. But typically, like, you know, all the heavy hitters, the guys that were doing action adventure, uh, including Brandon and, and other folks that I came up with were working in Bruce. You can style. see the evolutionary tree of art coming yeah. into those things. Yeah, yeah. So Bruce actually, when they brought me back to kind of be a design lead on one of his projects, I was like, wow, this is interesting. You know, um, I didn't expect it, but, uh, and I almost turned it down, but <laughs> that's a whole other story for another day. We can do that when you yeah. and I do a one-on-one. -on -one. How's that? <laughs> right on. When you're feeling better. Yeah, so yeah. that was it. But that was my intro to, honestly, my real intro to DC characters was getting, high, aside from Static, which is in the Milestone universe, and we right. kind of, we kind of sampled in the DC stuff, but my real intro was like a Crash Course 
getting the call front to to design a Bruce Timm cartoon and then like oh man like I always knew Superman and Batman and some sure, other yeah. uh you know more popular characters but I really fell in love with it through that project to be honest I, I mean I, I always loved Batman the animated series right but my knowledge wasn't as extensive so it was like man it what a joy it's been for me honestly uh the last decade of my career kind of falling in love with the charm and the absurdity and the and the fun of of the DC characters because nice my whole intro to it was through the work that I do here right right yeah all right let, let's jump to let's jump to Brandon I want you to to relive think back to that moment <laughs> with Kevin Smith where you made him and me tear up talking about like <laughs> you gotta do that again no pressure uh, but you were talking about like being a kid and watching your favorite shows and moving from there to here can you can you talk about that a little bit again yeah I I mean we were talking then too what was my entry point to the dc universe and that was uh super friends yeah. so i kind of got to learn about the the big characters uh the most famous characters in the dc universe through through that and through you know toys and stuff that were coming out at the time for that show um so powered armored lex luther is your your lex luther is that what you're saying no not necessarily <laughs> i i uh <laughs> Uh, it's funny, yeah, I don't have a lot of... I, I remember more of the heroes than the villains. I mean, Joker, Black Manta. Yeah. I remember, you know, I have vague memories of like the sure. Super Friends years as I was watching it, but I remember really liking the heroes more than uh, anything else. And I had the, the bed sheets and everything. I still have my Super Friends bed sheets. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. I'm not using them every night, man. They're okay, just I'm like, just they're like in well, a they have to go into rotation, place. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were, they were like, I, that was something I couldn't get rid of. Like that was a piece of my childhood. I just treasured mm -hmm. too much. You yeah, know? no, so I hear you. They are in a drawer somewhere. I just thought they were framed on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> You're all folded and <laughs> readily sealed. <laughs> right. <laughs> The filthiest thing, pretty much. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, it, it evolves. Um, I always loved animation. I think that was my my first love from Super Friends. It, it grew into other shows. I got really into GI Joe and Transformers when those were out. I mean, in, yeah, in the eighties, like that was right. that was the thing. He Man, all those shows. So um, uh, that was really my first love. And a little later, uh, as I got older I was still watching animation and I was seeing it evolve and that's when we got to Batman the animated series and mm. suddenly it was like oh, oh my yeah how I didn't know <laughs> yeah, you could yeah, do this no. with animation. I had yeah, just yeah, told yeah. the story on a, one, another podcast I was on where I was flipping because there was no internet right yeah. so you didn't know it was happening I was literally in college flipping through channels and I was like yeah it was Bruce and Selena in normal clothes having a conversation in yeah. the room and I'm like did he just say Selena right. I'm like what am I watching right yeah, now yeah. and and, you know, it had to take context clues for like five minutes before I realized what I was even seeing on, yeah. on the screen. Then the next episode after that was the, you know, Heart of Ice, Mr. Freeze right. episode where I'm like, who made Mr. Freeze horrifyingly relatable? Right. What happened with this? Yeah. You know, and we talk about that, that kind of level of step up of storytelling and animation being that that thing that leads into the sophistication of that leading into what you guys do on Young Justice as well. Yeah, so that, that was like a, a really great, another great time in animation, honestly, because I think at that point we had Batman the Animated Series, um, Robotech was out, I think, around that time, at least in my area where I grew up. So I was seeing, you know, stories from another culture, but were yeah. more sophisticated, had right. big arcs, like long, tons of long characters, form storytelling. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, adult relationships going on that, you know, <laughs> you weren't finding that in Super Friends, right? Right. And then, and things like Akira, I yeah, think was, that was all, yep. those, that was all mm -hmm. like mind blowing yeah, stuff. So that like just changed the way I thought about right. animation. And I was drawing a lot at the time in high school. And, um, I, I was collecting comics at that time as well, but it was animation. I think that was driving me even more than comics to like push my art. They're kind of together. Uh, it was animation that was really driving me, but, but after high school, I, I really, double down on comics. Mm -hmm. I think I just couldn't get in my head going into animation as a career. I had a similar, yeah, blockage. You know, I don't want to interrupt, but what I think for me, what, what, what I reflect on is, is that with comics, it's so simple in terms of how how it's made basically yeah like we're going to do a deep dive into how the show gets made versus comics right but talk about comics for a second well i mean no, i don't want to break away from brandon too much because i'm enthralled but the the, the idea of <laughs> i'm often enthralled by brandon <laughs> the, the idea of uh 
No, like, yeah, believe it or not, we don't just sit around and tell our origin stories <laughs> when we're working on this show. <laughs> but uh, what it's such a superhero thing to do. Um, no, the uh, You have to l- fight first and then realize right. you're allies. Exactly. And then, right, and, yeah. <laughs> That's same been name. done on the show <laughs> often. <laughs> I th- I th- oh, we're on the same team. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's just, it's just, it seems so like straightforward when you open up a comic book and you see the credits and you're like, oh, I get it. Like a guy, the, a guy wrote this. It's a reasonable list of yeah, people exactly. that are working on With thing. Animation is right. like magic. You know what I mean? Like even, even, <laughs> even if you can look at the credits and you're like, I still don't get how they made it move. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> we had that. Uh, uh, literally yesterday I was watching a, a, I don't remember what movie we were watching. It was an animated movie with my son. And he's like, what's this? He's three. And it's like all the credits going by at the end. And I'm trying to explain like, these are all the people who made this work. And mm. it was just scrolling forever. Yeah, yeah. I can't even remember what we were watching. But, you know, yeah. The right. comparison. Yeah. It, yeah, you get, you get letter. You get your anchor. You get your yeah. artist. You get your writer. You get, you're, you're good. Right? Yeah. So I think in that way, Brandon and I probably have a similar kind of background when it comes to like we were attracted to animation because i you know same thing for me like you know yeah you know watching you can, you can envision the wheelhouse like right. i can do this because it only takes if i get a few of the right people i can do this thing yeah it would never i can see i would never or enter you into can, your head that yeah. oh if i get the 500 right people sure. i can make a show yeah well or i think i thought too like with animation i knew enough about it that it was like you know a frame by frame process 24 sure. frames a second Sounds i'm like i cannot yeah me. i can't yeah. get my head into yeah. doing that i just want to do great drawings and that's sure. what comics were all right. about yeah. to me so I, you're talking the '90s too. So it was a lot of a lot of Todd McFarlane splash pages. Yeah, and like it was big, booming. Yeah, yeah, a lot of excitement. If that, that guy time. can do it, yeah, no <laughs> There's kidding. a lot of that. In Don't the get 90s me started. Too. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. If he can do it for right. sure, I'm good enough. Right. No, no disrespect to Todd McFarlane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that was kind of the image mentality. It's yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it was very relatable. You know what I mean? And very dynamic at the same time. And, yeah, exactly. You know, that was my childhood as well. So yeah. it was similar. Uh, relation to that stuff. so i didn't know that you did art brandon yeah so i want to get into that because i think that might feed into some other questions that i have to ask later but so you have did you you went to college did you focus on art did yeah you focus after on... high school i applied to the Kubert school oh in yeah new jersey and i um actually got so a, many ads and comics i, I know right in school right? yeah uh and it's great my name's like in the alumni in the list alumni. sometimes <laughs> oh, nice. on that thing and um that was a very cool experience i I got to know Joe Kubert. Nice. He was running the school. I got to know uh, his sons, Adam and Andy. I was like the night watchman at the school for a little while. So nice. I would like lock the school up at night and good night, Andy. How dare you <laughs> never <laughs> tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> I the Andy Griffith show whistling in my head right now. Did you have one bullet in your pocket? Like, <laughs> no, like, like I, was, I was unarmed. Okay. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. my chance to do a, a night watchman Vietti. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Season four. I was lucky to get a, a scholarship to the school. Actually, Marvel Comics paid my way through the Kubert School. They had a, a scholarship the year that I started. Oh, wow. And that came with an internship. So I had a summer internship working for John Ramita Sr. Oh, wow. uh, in the in the bullpen. I was like one of the Whoa. last Ramita's Raiders when Ramita Sr. was um, one of the uh, the art director, I believe, at, Holy cow. Uh, at Marvel. So I, I completed those three years and I, you know, went through my own little journey of art and what I enjoyed to drawing the most. And Batman the Animated Series was still huge in my head. And I was drawing a lot of my assignments in kind of a, a Bruce Timmish style, like a, definitely sort of an animation style. And I really enjoyed that challenge. And I was trying to get work at Marvel in DC after graduation doing that kind of a style. And they, they both had books like that, but very, very few. And they were all staffed up they had all the people that they needed yeah and then at some point uh somebody had shown me an ad in comics buyer's guide that uh bruce tim had drawn it was it was uh like a drawing of of batman pointing at the camera like uncle sam i want you i want yeah and he was basically gearing up for the new batman superman adventures Uh, and they were recruiting and they were they were looking for green people it's hilarious that they would take out an ad. I know, right? Like, yeah. it just it's probably wouldn't happen era, today. Yeah. But I, again, it was like I had that animation mental block. And even though right. I was kind of drawing in his style, I'm just like, all right, maybe I'll just send my stuff in and maybe I can get some freelance to tide me over till I can break into right. comic. Yeah. But sending my stuff in led to a in-person interview and they hired me. Nice. And that was in 
97. And and so, so you got hired job. to do animation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. how did that trans... Well, not... He wasn't animated. Not animated, but I mean, I was I was hired to do storyboards. Oh, okay. And gotcha, I gotcha. went... Yeah, because I mean, all animation's done overseas. So we generally okay. just do pre-production here, which is, you know, all the writing, design, storyboards, color work is done here. Did you do character design stuff like Phil does now? I did for... Briefly, though, like I kind of realized pretty early, like that just, it wasn't something that I was really taking to. I really enjoyed story. Yeah. That was always my number one thing was, was story. I, I wrote tracks. a lot. Yeah. I wrote a lot <laughs> when I was a kid and drew a lot. So those two things together merged in storyboards. I, I didn't really understand what storyboarding was prior to getting the job here. Like, and I, I told him like, I don't That's know what story. A lot of, a lot of us start is just like, you know, well, get thrown in. Yeah. Yeah. Correct yeah, me if was I'm wrong, deep end. but I mean, it's, it's the Venn diagram between comics and animation. Like yeah. it's something that seems yeah. like you guys would be familiar enough with to take that step into. Yeah. If you have a, it's good to have a comic book background. There's a lot of nuance to boarding and lifetime to master kind of thing, but. Yeah. I was it's, missing the the basics of filmmaking though. Like sure. that's something that, yeah. that you, you do have to have some understanding of basic yeah. filmmaking right. that is very different from comics. Yeah. Right. Then I had to learn that on the job and I had to learn to draw fast. I think right. Uh, storyboarding is an incredibly high speed drawing exercise and I didn't have that either. So I, I really had it kind of stacked against me with that first job. We're, we're our next interview is actually with one of the storyboarders. So we're going to do a deep dive into storyboarding if people want to hear about that as well. But I want to, I, I really want to go off on what you guys just said, but I think I want to keep it tightened up sure. on the things that only you guys can share with us. And so, so let's jump to Greg. Greg, did you know anything about comics before you uh, went into Young Justice? How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so much older than everybody else. <laughs> that, um, Have you read a comic? How does one answer that question? I mean, I you think for me, emerged probably into animation. the earliest thing was um, the Adam West uh, Batman series when I was like uh, three years old or something like that. And, you know, we talked about this on with Kevin Smith. Uh, you know, we didn't know it was camp. Right. You know, episode aired cliffhanger next day the conclusion came on and and i started collecting comics and my dad didn't get it he was like well they're magazines you don't keep magazines that's, right. what, that's what dads yeah. are supposed to say so man. he every summer when i went to camp to sleep away camp my dad would throw out all my comic books yeah he regrets that now because he realizes he thinks and i let him think this that all these books would have paid for my college sure. education or sure, something yeah. like that. But um, I learned fairly early on that if I bought a big treasury edition, those large size things, he'd go, okay, those must, They're and different. those were all reprints, you yeah. know, but, but he'd be like, oh, those must be worth something. So he didn't throw <laughs> out treasury editions. So I, I didn't. Um, wow. And they used to have dioramas in the back and I'd cut them up and destroy their value and, and stuff like that. I have a great Tarzan story that I could tell you someday, but it's really off topic. <laughs> um, and uh, so I just, you know, when I was really young, I also didn't get, I mean, you talked about being a Marvel fan and Marvel, I, I didn't get there were that there were different companies. companies. I mean, in other words, I'd see Green Lantern team up with Superman in an issue and I'd see Spider-Man team up with Thor in an issue and for all I knew, the next issue, Batman and Captain America would team up. I didn't right. get initially that there were two different, you this know, there's just superheroes and I loved. well into his 30s. Yeah, no, it didn't. Yeah. But uh, even once I started figuring it out, I started coming up with my own characters and my own universe. And then once I got the whole Earth 1, Earth 2 concept that DC had back in the day, and I just sort of th said, well, okay, so there's Earth Prime in the middle. And then Marvel's universes go off this oh, way and DC's nice. go off this way. And so I was going to create stuff on Earth Prime and my character would be the one who could visit either Marvel or right. DC because I just love all those characters. Right. Um, and then uh, I guess that was pretty much the situation until I was 15 or 16, at which point I got my dad to stop throwing away my shit. But... Uh, uh, you see, you warned him about the language. I did, you know, yeah, you're right, yeah. Warned. You know, there was a there was a comic book store in San Jose for a while. It was called My Mom Threw Mine Out. 
<laughs> because that's when I worked in comic stores, that's all we heard all the time. You know, I had this. But I'm like, that's why it's worth something because all of our moms threw them all out. That's, that's right. what happened. It wasn't yeah. my mom, it was my dad. But uh, in your case, it was your dad. That yeah. Poly bagged X Force number one, though. Oh, God. <laughs> Ten copies of the two and a half million print run. Yeah. Uh, then when I was in college, you know, I'd go to a comic book store every week by that time, and, um, and uh, Marvel announced a uh, search for new talent. And I thought uh, this was maybe the one smart decision I, or idea I ever had, which was that the thought occurred to me that they would just be inundated, instantly inundated with artists and writers and, and everyone submitting stuff to them. This was in, you know, 1983, I want to say. Okay. So I thought, you know, if Marvel is announcing a new talent search, I'll bet anything DC's going to announce one soon yeah very soon so instead of prepping stuff for marvel i prepped a bunch of material for dc and a month later like clockwork dc announced its own new talent wow search and i sent that material in and later i worked for dc on staff in new york at 666 fifth avenue like that address isn't portentous but um and later i found the logbook where they logged in all the new submissions for New Talent Showcase, which was the book where they published stuff from these people. And uh, I was literally the second uh, submission logged in. And then, somebody who was in front of somebody got theirs in number one. Yeah. You were number but two. But I was number two, and that's because as soon as they announced it, I had this stuff already literally in an envelope. Yeah. And wow. I just put it in the mailbox and sent it off. So then, um, and so you think that's how I got in, and it's not. What happened is, and I, Bait and switch. when they, what they did when they logged the stuff in is they, they put down the name and the person's address and then they filed the submission to look at later. And so later, again, I'm working at DC and I found my submission. It, they, when they'd filed it, it had slipped down between two hanging folders and slid down to the bottom oh. of the file cabinet. So when they were looking through the log book, they saw my name and address, but couldn't find my submission. And they had two packets, one for writers and one for artists. And about 75% of the submissions were for artists and only okay. about 25 were from writers. So they said, well, he's probably an artist. So they sent me the artist submission pack. Okay. And I was 19 and I was outraged in the way that only a 19 year old can be. He can be outraged. Thank God there was no Twitter. Right. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so it was. The end of it ends up being <laughs> worse, and yet it still paid off for me. But uh, so I wrote this angry letter to Dick Giordano, who at the time was executive <laughs> editor of DC Comics. The stones on this saying, guy. Uh, no, I, I was saying, you know, if you couldn't find my stuff, you should have just let me know. I'm a professional, which was not true. <laughs> But I wrote that. Fake it you um, and, I'm yelling and at you I, as a of course professional. I kept <laughs> copies, which that part was true. I did have copies. Nice. And I would have just resent copies. And I just said, I find this very unprofessional. <laughs> and I wrote this letter and I put it in an envelope. Keep in mind, we didn't have email back then. I right. wrote this letter. I put it in an envelope. I walked out to the mailbox. <laughs> this is at school. I put it in the mailbox. And immediately I thought, what have I done? <laughs> I'm never going to work in comics. Oh ever. my God. <laughs> Don't press So I them. thought, all right, it's all over. And I just put it out of my head. And at the time, horrible. Um, <laughs> there may have been a lot of geeks in the closet back then, but, but yeah. back then at Stanford University in 1983, I only knew one other guy yeah. who was into comics like I was. Um, and I had a car and he didn't. So I would drive the two of us to the comic book store once a week. Uh -huh. And no one else, I literally knew no one else at school who knew anything about um, comics, so including my roommate at the time. So my roommate, Tom, back then we had landlines, um, and my roommate, Tom, answered the phone in our dorm room, and he goes, he says, it's for you, it's Dick Giordano. And I thought, this is Doug, <laughs> my friend Doug. Messing my with only you, other right. Messing with me. So I get out of the phone, I'm like, so this is Dick Giordano. And he starts talking and I realize this is not Doug. <laughs> oh no. Um, and I quickly realized this is Dick Giordano. And he's like, I read your letter. 
like cringing. He's like, it was very well written. Uh, and you had some legitimate <laughs> points, you know. <laughs> and uh, we should be doing a better job of handling this stuff. And uh, and then he and I don't even remember half of what he said. He was very nice. <laughs> you were blacking out at nice. that point. Yeah, I was. You know, um, my eyes were rolling back in my head. But uh, and he goes, "So you'd be in New York anytime soon? Because we should meet." And I'm quickly looking at a calendar and going, uh, "Yeah, in fact, I'll be there in March, which was my spring break." And he says, "Great." And we set a time and a date and everything like that. I get off the phone and I'm like, I got to figure out how to get to New York in March. <laughs> and um, wound up, uh, my dad had some frequent flyer miles. So I, he gave me the frequent flyer miles so I could fly to New York. And my, I had a cousin who lived in Manhattan and I crashed on her couch. I, and, I have to ask, did your dad know what the money was for having thrown all your comics out? Yeah, he did. And he, okay. my dad was actually very supportive. He didn't get it. Uh, certainly not when I was little, oh, well, um, but, fair, but he's always been very supportive. Although I will say that um, when I turned 40, he and I took a trip to Scotland and I was out of work for the upteenth time. And, you know, I've been, I have been a professional since I was uh, sold my first thing when I was 19 years old. So I've been a professional writer and, and since I was 19 and been in animation since 1986 or seven or something like that. But when I was 40 and out of work, he was like, it's not too late. You can still go to law school. <laughs> and I'm like, I looked at him and said, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> like, it is too late. You're going to have to let that one yeah. go. <laughs> He's like, okay, okay. Um, I tell that story now. He's like, I never said that. He's I'm like, you totally yeah, said never, that. The never too late stuff is overhyped. Um, it's too late. <laughs> there, there may be a point. We're all so I was in Manhattan in March of 83. Uh, it was St. Patrick's Day. The parade was canceled because it was pouring torrential rain. And um, I was getting ready and I was in a suit and tie because I thought it was a job interview. And so that's what you wore to a job interview. Of course, now I dress like jeans and t-shirts every single day, but um, I didn't know better then. And uh, my cousin was like, all right, I got you a subway map. I'm going to show you exactly how to get from my apartment to where you need to go. And I said, no, no, I, I'm afraid I get lost on the subway. I'm going to take a cab. And she says to me, you're going to, wow. you're going to uh, try and flag down a cab in Manhattan in the rain. I said, yeah, I, I think that's probably the best bet for me. And she, <laughs> and she doesn't say anything. She doesn't say like, yeah, that's going to be nearly impossible. She just says, yeah, good luck with that. And she leaves. So I go out with an umbrella and um, the first thing that happens is that the, um, the wind is so intense that the umbrella, you know, folds backwards. And then I step into a pothole like in Groundhog Day so that I'm up to my uh, one leg is up to my upper calf and, <laughs> and totally soaked. And of course, it takes me and it's still miraculous. I got a cap at all, but I did eventually. But it took 45 minutes to hail a cab. I finally got into Brandon's the cab rolling his eyes right now <laughs> <laughs> and made it to DC's offices. And by the time I got up there, I was like, a, you know, a wet rat. <laughs> right. I was just completely soaked to the bone. And but Dick was very cool and very nice. And um, I think he probably figured out even before I got there that despite what I'd written in the letter about being a professional, that in fact, I was just some idiot kid. Um, but he was a great mentor to me, really great, always really supportive. And uh, I started freelancing for DC my sophomore year of college and summer to my junior and senior year, I was like, I went to Dick and I said, look, I, I want you to be honest with me. Do you, do you think I've got anything? Yeah. If so, I'll, I'm all in and I'll, uh, and I'll move out here after I graduate. And he said, yeah, I think you've got something. In fact, I want to offer you a job when you graduate as an associate editor here. What were you getting your degree in at the time? English with a creative writing emphasis. Um, uh, and uh, it's like, great, I had a job. So all through my senior year, all my friends are like, uh, job interviews and all this stuff and really intense and, and nervous. And I'm like, hey, I got my job waiting for me. It's all good. And then as you know, May and June start to roll around and I'm about to graduate, I'm like, uh, you know, calling Dick up and saying, so um, 
when do you want me to start? I mean, I can start as soon as June, whatever, uh, but I wouldn't mind taking, you know, a, a few weeks off after school ends. Uh, so if you don't need me until July or August, that'd be fine. And he's like, yeah, I don't think I'll need you before then. And, and then as I, these calls kept happening and it kept getting vaguer and vaguer and oh. vaguer. Oh. So and so painful. finally, I went, my very first San Diego Comic-Con was in um, 1985 after I had graduated, and I couldn't pin him down about when he wanted me to start. So he was going to San Diego, so I uh, drove down to San Diego and went to the convention, which was a very different experience in 1985 than yeah. it is now. Um, it was actually still a comic book convention there. And I got to hang out with Dick and... Pat Bastian and I met a whole bunch of really cool people like Alan Moore and Dave Stevens and had lunch with Dave Stevens and Dick and and I was like Dick I, and he's like yeah l let's just meet with Alan Moore first and then we'll talk and then, <laughs> let's just, and he and as and it was working because I was like <laughs> these were my heroes you know yeah, that he was introducing right. me to and everything on the one hand but on the other hand I could also sort of sense he's stalling and then ultimately I finally sort of got him alone and he finally admitted that there was a hiring freeze at, at uh, uh, Warner Books, which owned uh, DC. He and couldn't have told you that earlier? <laughs> he was hoping. If he had, he wouldn't have met Dave Stevens. Sure. You know, uh, uh, Alan Moore, but uh, still. I think he was hoping, like for the hiring freeze had started in April or May. He was hoping it would He was hoping it would out. be lifted yeah. and it wasn't. Um, and so I realized I had a decision to make. I could still move to New York. I'm still freelance for DC and I knew I had to be in New York to freelance for them because um, I wasn't established enough to, you had to show your face. Yeah. I had to be yeah, there. Yeah. You the wanted time. to be present. Yeah. Be a regular. So, and I thought, well, all right, you know, I don't have any other job prospects. So if I'm working at McDonald's, I might as well work at McDonald's in New York. Yeah. And, nice. and in LA. And so I got a job at a bookstore. I couldn't get hired at a comic book store. I, I applied for work Dang. at multiple comic stores. And I had what's written the, and what's the written test? comics by then. <laughs> and I could not get hired there, but uh, at a Crown Books. Nah, son. Tarzana. Geek cred not established. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you think this is, 2018? Yeah. So uh, I got hired at Crown Books in Tarzana just for the summer so I could build up a little bit of a war chest because I was living at home and so I didn't have a lot of expenses and, and I got a little bit of money because I knew New York was expensive. My son just spent this past summer uh, in New York and and keep in mind, this is what, 30 years ago. Jumping later. around the timeline a little bit. Yeah, but he <laughs> says to me at one point, he goes, Manhattan's really expensive. Yeah, no kidding. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you picked up on that. Good job, Benny. But, <laughs> life, life lessons, man. Uh, <laughs> but I knew it'd be expensive, and so I, I spent the summer at home building a war chest, and then I decided, okay, I'd move in. I'd move to New York in uh, October and uh, look for a job in advertising or, or wherever, a right, magazine right. or whatever. I uh, met with Will Shorts at, what magazine was that? Was it just called Puzzle or I forget? Oh, yeah. That's how I was like, Will Shorts, where do I know that name? He's the yeah, Puzzle he's, Master guy from NPR, right? Uh, yeah, he's the New York Times crossword puzzle editor and he was a, a friend he was the brother of dick shorts who was a friend of my dad so you know i was just all this stuff and then right before i was about to leave i mean literally like i was leaving on a monday and on the friday before that um dick calls and he says look i can't still got the hiring freeze i can't offer you the associate editor position but we just lost our editorial assistant i'm not allowed to hire new positions but i can if we lose someone i can fill an empty slot. Nice. So he said, would you be willing to come in as an editorial assistant? And I'm like, associate editor, editorial assistant. What's the difference? He's like, well, and what it amounted to is basically it was Xerox boy. You know, I would Xerox everything. I would um, right, ship right. things out, FedEx or um, DHL or whatever. And, and I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. So I came in and worked six months there, then got promoted to assistant editor. And then finally got promoted to associate editor. And as soon as I got promoted, I quit um, because it was not. Uh, there are great people there, but it was not hmm. a pleasant place to work right. back then. 
How long, what was that span from when you got? Two years. Two years. Yeah, so six months as editorial assistant, about a year and a half as associate editor, and then, I mean, as assistant editor, and then I got promoted. I didn't actually quit right right away, but I knew I didn't want to stay. Hmm. So I applied to graduate schools because I also couldn't get my head around. I didn't have any other job prospects. And at that time, it wasn't too late yet. Right. It's yeah. still, right. still time on the clock. So uh, I wound up uh, giving very long notice so that they could. I said, I'm happy to train my replacement and all this stuff. Right, right. And they never got organized enough to hire a replacement until after I was mm-hmm. gone. Eventually hired Mark Wade. But we didn't overlap at all. I mean, he took my place, but they hired him like three or four weeks after I had left. They were trying to decide if they needed somebody in that spot. They were like, ah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Who's the next guy? Right, exactly. Conclude part one, part two, T minus seven days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.